Hello everybody, Terrence Pop here with another episode of Live from the Lair. And uh, I got, I don't know, over the past year, year and a half, you know, I've been talking about the the ESP, the ESP thing. And uh, periodically I get emails from guys asking me to tell army stories that reflect anything ESP-like. And uh, I did this on the supporter stream. I got a whole bunch of stories that uh, I remembered, wrote down. And um, it's going to go through a few here. Dating in the Western world has never been more dangerous, expensive, or fruitless for men. But most of us just can't seem to stop doing it. Why? Uh, because she different and she loves me. Sure, buddy. Sure. As long as Western females continue to labor under the delusion that they're the prize, you need to pack up your toys and leave this slumber party massacre. And while you're waiting for the bus, get yourself a copy of Peace of Mind or Peace of... Slot C. The ultimate men's guide to comprehending why, what, and how when it comes to women you're dealing with or dealt with. I'm not gonna lie, this subtitle could be shorter, like the men women won't date. There's a link in the meat gazer box, so start reading. When I say ESP, okay, I, I am not like somebody who can like grab your hand, read your fortune. Okay, that's not me. Um, in fact, I really, for the most part, don't have active control over it. It just happens from time to time. And ideally, when you need it most. Also, a lot of the ESP stories you can explain away with just experience and so forth. But somewhere those two things meet, okay? Like it could be a gut feeling, or something going on and, and, and you just make the decisions that need, that need to be done or you take the actions that need to happen at that spot and you don't hesitate about it. All right, now, uh, this one here, um, this first story. Now, I was at Abu, Abu Ghraib Prison 2004. Okay. Um, I remember the first Fallujah fight. I don't remember the exact date of when it went down. And, uh, and at that particular time, I was kind of in the doghouse with my chain of command and you know, they had me doing bullshit stuff, and uh, I was not happy about it at first. But then I realized I had virtually no supervision. I was an E-8 Green Beret Airborne Ranger with a combat jump star and combat patch and two wars under my belt. So... That gave me a lot of juice to go and speak with people and negotiate and, and, and make sure things are getting done correctly or or I was working, you know, top cover for individuals or in the background I was pulling strings to make sure things were going smoothly for my guys. And this particular day I had been going out with a couple of five tons on the convoy out to the Fallujah combat site bef before it kicked off. And uh, there's a vast difference between the Marines and the Army. Like the Marines really showed up three and two days before the uh, attack and like literally lived under ponchos in fucked up conditions. And you could just tell... The Marine Corps doesn't give a fuck about its its fighters. They're just a walking wall of meat. And you, you can see it in the casualties they took and how they treated their wounded. And you can even hear the stupidity of how the Marines fought in combat on the on the radio. All right. And, and I, I'm, I know I'm up. I'm upsetting any Marine fans out there because I'm saying stupid. I got it. I'm sorry. Um. I'm, I'm from the college of fight harder, not smarter, or fight smarter, not harder, or the Marines, they fight harder, not smarter, and you can, you can see the difference. They knew that the military, 
units that were there and the Marines that were there kind of got used to seeing me um, come around. I brought MREs and water and so forth and uh, tried to help out as much as I could. And then uh, we got, I got the word that, you know, it was going to kick off, uh, mainly because they set up an alternate talk inside Abu that I, you know, spent a lot of time in so I could see on the board exactly what was going on and who was doing what, where, and why. Okay, now that alternate talk was never uh, populated by the officers in charge or the, the commanding officers. It was just an alternate in case they needed it. So what that meant, it was staffed. It had all the boards. There were people in there updating everything. The radios were there. I mean, I mean, so quite base, you know, I was literally hearing what was uh, being said and done, you know, through the upper chains of, chains of command. So, you know, it kicks off and... On that particular day, I had uh, made three runs. Now, I wasn't the convoy commander, all right? I wasn't in charge. I just went along for the ride to do what I can do. So I get there, and uh, there's the casualty collection points. There's one for the Marines. There's one for the Army, and it's being compl run completely differently, all right? Now... I remember talking to the gunny who was running the Marine Corps casualty collection point. I'm like, look, Abu has got a cache. Uh, it can do surgery. You know, they're only allowing me to take out the low priority guys or the, or the walking wounded to go there. And do you have anyone that needs, that needs to see a surgeon immediately? And he's like, no, 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 no. We got, we got our choppers coming in. They're taking our people out. You're fine. So I started asking some questions because I was getting like this gut feeling like, you know, this doesn't sound right to me. So I'm like, when was the last helicopter here to pick up your guys? He's like, oh, 45 minutes ago. And I had been there for maybe an hour and a half or so. And there were all kinds of choppers landing, but most of them were army airframes. All right. Uh, I don't know if, if they were waiting for ones that were designated just for the Marines. Um, and it wouldn't be the first time Marines follow orders to the letter and, you know, exclude all common sense. All right. So I'm literally at the casualty collection point. I'm like, you, you, you get in the truck. Yeah. And, and I look over and there's three Marines on stretchers. They're, they're conscious, but they were torped pretty good. One was on his side because he had a, a sucking chest wound. And another guy had a tourniquet on his leg. I uh, made a, a quick in inquiry and his femoral artery had been severed. Uh, but it wasn't high up in the groin. It was lower, so they're able to get a tourniquet on it. But he had lost a lot of blood. And I just had this fucked up feeling. I'm like, nope. Uh, so I have, you know, one five ton pretty much packed with dudes. I have another one that's two thirds packed. I have room for more people. And then I go to the Marine, the, the gunny. And I'm like, look, these three guys in stretchers, you know, I can have them on an operating table. It's only eight miles away by truck. All right. Because the way your choppers are coming in, these guys are going to die. I mean, they're losing blood. They're fucked up. It's, it's hot as fuck. And I'm like, all right, gunny, just do me a favor. All you got to do is just walk over there and ignore me for three minutes these guys are gone and then we can say our sorries and work it out after the fact. So he didn't say anything, but he did walk away. So, you know, I, you know, I think he agreed with what I, I was going to do. It's just, you know, the way the, the Marine culture is, it is what it is. So I was giving him plausible deniability why these three guys just disappeared. And I'm like, all right, on the truck and quite literally, you know, I had a bunch of grunts down there and they pick up these guys and they stick them on the truck. And of course they're fucking with the Marines the whole time. Like, Hey, you couldn't get out of the fucking way, you dumbass, blah, blah, blah. And the guy with the sucking chest one is like, he'd barely breathe. He's like, fuck off. I'm like, all right. So, you know, we roll back to the cash. I get these three guys spun up, go on the table, get stabilized. 
and then they get flown to the green zone where they get like higher level um, surgical intervention and then from there they go to wherever they, they were supposed to go now typically that's usually Langstuhl Germany or the Navy Marine guys get flown to Bethesda in the United States, which is a whole cluster fucking of itself. I mean, the flight there is long. If people are really fucked up, I mean, I just don't understand why the Marines and the Army don't don't get along better. So I'm pretty sure those uh, at least one of those three guys, you know, would have died because the ER nurse after the fact it's like yeah that marine you brought in um he wouldn't have made it another 40 minutes he was they had, they had a tourniquet on there but it wasn't stopping everything and uh you know we had to give him i gave him like two units of blood just to stabilize him and then repack it and uh surgically you know repair the bullet hole or, or the nick in the artery and then he got sent for it so i don't i don't really know what happened to those guys uh, let's see. Okay, next one. All right, now, I had been moved to NCOIC of security for the entire base of Abu Ghraib. And NCOIC stands for Non-Commissioned Officer in Charge. So, I run all the daily activities. Um, I handle a large majority of the decisions that need to be made. I, I manage contracts, money, whatever, is if it pertained to the prison. And I only really involved my, my higher-ups if I needed horsepower to get something done. For the most part, I didn't. And uh, I had set up a lot of different procedures when I, I took over. Um, you know, I had... A bunch of piles of dirt put in with Tanglefoot to stop car bombs from getting right up to the walls. I had broken glass bottles, you know, uh, cemented on the top of the walls with concertina wire just to keep people out. Because you can throw a blanket over the concertina wire and you should be okay. It's another thing when you have the bottom of a broken wine bottle sticking up and your weight comes down. It will, it will fucking cut you. I did that. I put in the, uh, made sure there were dogs at the front gate, you know, and that later on became a problem in like 2006 because, you know, Haji hates dogs. And what are you going to do? I, I put it up there. I, I had them put up there for psychological reasons, uh, basically to keep bad guys from being stupid. And one of the things I would do is I would go to each tower just as the sun was coming up and i would take a digital photograph i had a, a set of binos it was like two or three megapixels at the time very expensive now they're just they're dirt cheap almost worthless and i would take a picture i would go back to the top and i would compare pictures and on two different occasions you know i remember there was a, a vehicle i had never i had not seen and one of, I remember one was a Ford probe. So I'm like, okay, I, I, I look at the picture and I just got this really weird gut feeling. And I'm like, ah, ah. so I get the, the Marine Corps QRF. We spin them up. We roll out there to inspect the vehicle. We walk up to it. And the only thing in the car was the front seat. They had ripped out the passenger seat. They had ripped out the back seat, the paneling, everything. Okay, now, for those of you that aren't familiar, that's what they do. Because the guy who's going to drive it, it's a one-way trip. They take out everything else. They pack the inside of the car and the trunk with explosives. And sometimes they even go inside the quarter panels and the rear fenders and just pack as much shit in there as they can. And then they drive up to what they're going to do and boom. And uh, we were, you know, there was quite a few car bomb attacks that were happening on a fairly regular basis. And usually the car bomb would roll up to a checkpoint and then detonate. And like four to six individuals nearby would literally get turned to red paste with just bits of boots left behind. So we came out, we saw it. I'm like, okay. I then go back. I spin up the CBs. They come out with a bulldozer. We flip the car over, smash it up, and like the Haji's out there throwing a fit. Nah, I don't fucking care. 
same thing happened but this one was an older station wagon and uh they were they had just taken out the back two rows of seats um and that would have been a huge car bomb we did the same thing just smashed it up flipped it over so that was a that was an actual uh that was a gut feeling esp thing another one um we had individuals that would come in uh, local nationals that worked inside the prison and uh i was not a fan of this but hey it is what it is those decisions were made way above me and uh i would always like to keep an eye on them and sometimes i would assign individuals to you know keep an eye out above and beyond the escort detail that was going with all these people because quite frankly it's hot you know sometimes the escort detail especially if it's the same guys they just get used to it it's a routine thing they don't pay as much attention so i would have a second set of eyes that's not caught in that whole dynamic watching and on three different occasions i caught haji pacing off targets inside the prison now for those of you that don't know what this is you set up a mortar you fire some rounds at your target you take the mortar uh, apart you write down all the dope all the information elevation and what have you and you remove the equipment and you leave quickly and then you have people on the inside find those impacts and then from there they just pace off the distance direction and distance to a major target that they do want to hit that information gets relayed back they come back set up the mortar exactly how it was before put the same dope on the sites they make the adjustments and they fire again and they'll do that two and three two and three times and quite frankly by the third and uh, second or third time they do that it's fairly accurate it might not be timed correctly but it, it is fairly accurate so we caught these three dudes and uh you know again it was that gut feeling i caught them pacing and immediately they got the uh the black bag and they went right to the whip me spank me camp i wasn't even fucking around with that shit I didn't want to, you know, see people, well, I'm just not going to have people needlessly killed on my watch, especially if I could stop it from happening. Uh, let's see. All right. And now this is a big one here. I was on a convoy going down to, uh, one of, one of the port cities in Iraq and it was, a significant drive we had to it was like a two-day thing you know we drove for most of the first day and part of the second day and then we got to the destination all right so we had uh made it to our holdover point you know we refueled racked out ate drank our water what have you and the next day we rolled out now I was not the convoy commander. I was not in charge. I was in the vehicle of the convoy commander at the time. And, you know, we reviewed all of all of the routes, the primary alternate contingency routes, and everything was copacetic in toll. We're the second day we've been driving for like an hour and uh i i get the convoy commander's attention we pull over i tell him look the primary route that you want to go on i'm having a really bad feeling about it can we take the alternate route just for that leg of the journey he's like no problem sir not a big deal and it was some captain i don't remember his name so we take that we get to our destination i didn't think anything about it well that night the captain calls me to his uh his chew which where he was staying and he goes how did you know that that route we were going to take was was going to be you know contested and i'm like what do you mean he goes well 
after we went to the uh, con, you know the alternate route, there was a convoy that went down that same route 30 minutes later and just got decimated. They lost like 30% of their people, had two or three vehicles deadlined and destroyed on the spot. They had to call in air assets. It was just a huge clusterfuck. That was that was straight up gut feeling thing right there. And and it's hard to explain, you know, and and this is like before the TBI. Cuz you know, after the TBI, the ESP went up, you know, a lot. You know, it went up a lot more. I I can't put a number on it. It's hard to explain. So to this day, when I get gut feelings, I pay attention. Because I'm not the only one out there that gets these gut feelings. And I'm just wondering if the world would be a better place if more people just listen to what their gut is trying to tell them. Because sometimes that makes all the difference. 